Welcome to the 2023 Bloomington State of the City Address. I'm Debbie Brailfree. I'm president of the Bloomington Rotary Club, and this marks more than 25 years that the city, the chamber, and Rotary have collaborated for this State of the City event. We start today with a special presentation in honor of the Bloomington Police Department's 70th anniversary. Our State of the City, <laughs> it does deserve a round of applause. Our State of the City event will begin with a posting of the colors by the Bloomington Police Honor Guard. Leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance will be Bloomington Police Chief Brooker Hodges, who is also a member of the Bloomington Chambers Board of Directors. If you all, please stand. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Present arms. Pledge of Allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you. Arms. Ready, step. Please be seated. Thank you for attending the 2023 State of the City Address. We are really pleased that the Bloomington Rotary Club continues to be a partner with the city and the chamber in this annual tradition. Bloomington Rotary was founded in 1961 under the banner of service above self. We are part of a global community of 1.4 million leaders who are committed to changing the lives of both local and international community members. For example, Rotary has been on the front lines in the fight to eradicate polio from every corner of the globe since 1988. We have now achieved 99.9% .9 reduction in polio cases around the world. If you'd like to learn more about Rotary, talk to one of our members who are here today and spread out at many of the different tables. I would now like to introduce President and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber, Jonathan Weinhagen. Debbie's a tough act to follow, but I'm going to try. I, good morning, good afternoon. Haven't seen, we're still morning. All right. Jonathan Weinhagen, President and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Couldn't be happier and more excited to be with all of you today. Um, I'd like to thank Jamie and Mayor Bussey for inviting us to be a part of the State of the City event uh, once again. I get the great privilege of starting off the event by thanking the people who helped make this happen. Uh, that's the sponsors of today's lunch. So I'd like to acknowledge the Mall of America, Radisson Blue, the Bloomington Convention and Visitors Bureau. I see Bonnie right up front here, Center Point Energy, Commuter Services, Larkin Hoffman, Normandale Community College, XL Energy, and Fast Signs of Bloomington. 
join me in giving them a huge round of applause for their support for this program. My notes tell me if you're a representative of one of these companies, could you like take a stand? And I think we're gonna have like half the room stand up, uh, which is just a great show of support for this community and the work that we do. Thank you very much. I also want to recognize the Radisson Blue. This is our seventh year hosting the State of the City here at this venue, um, and it's incredible. I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that this month marks the 10-year anniversary of Radisson Blue as an asset, not just in the city of Bloomington, but across our region and state. So the Radisson Blue team, could you stand up and be acknowledged? This place, this place has been a game changer for this region. Um, and we're just so fortunate. Um, and you'll see many more of their team across the room serving us today, um, outstanding. So we really value the partnership and the work and the leadership that you provide. Um, I also get the opportunity and challenge, and I've shared with the team, of recognizing our elected officials. I think I was volunteered as tribute because this is the hardest part of an event like this because we hope that we get everybody who is registered acknowledged. Um, and if somebody doesn't get acknowledged, um, they're gonna be really upset at me. So I think the mayor has lined this up perfectly. So I'd like to recognize um, our elected leaders and appointed leaders who are here today. Um, Bloomington City Council members, Chao Moa and Lana, Lana Delasadandro. Did I get close? No, not even close? I'll get closer. See, this is the whole, the whole risk of this. Um, we know we have a, an incredible school district and a unique school district that is concurrent with our city, um, unique in the state. We've got an incredible showing from the school district today. Uh, Tom Bennett, Matt Demick, Kelly Corman, Maya Olson, Heather Stark, Don Steigoff, and Beth Beebe. School board members, all right. Doing it for the kids, we love it. We love it. We know that we've got our police chief here um, and others. I want to you know, thank you and appreciate you for the work that you do, for being here today. Um, you really are part of what makes Bloomington a great place to live, work, and do business. I'd also like to acknowledge our chamber leadership that's here today. Um, we've got an incredible board of directors that helps lead and steward the work. Um, I'm going to actually be safer on this because I work for them. Um, I'm not going to name them by name. I'm going to ask our Bloomington Chamber board members to stand and be recognized. We appreciate the work that you do as business leaders and community leaders each and every day. So please stand and be recognized. This is the part where Jamie and the mayor get concerned because I didn't send them my remarks. Um, but they're going to give me a couple of minutes to talk, and I'm going to do just that. <laughs> They're not gonna invite me back next year. A year ago, we sat in this room, and if you were anything like me, it was one of the first big events back. It was our first State of the City back in person. And I think you know, we were all holding our breaths to some extent. Like, is this the beginning of the end of a global health pandemic? What is the future gonna hold? Where are we gonna be? And we spent a lot of time reflecting on the last two years, and there was a lot to celebrate. You know, the partnerships that we had, distributing two million masks, coming together to serve our businesses and our community. I remember a, a crew of nurses that were acknowledged for the incredible work that they did during the pandemic. Um, and it was, it was awesome. And the beginning of what, of what I think is the beginning, the beginning of what I believe is what's next. Um, I'm told by my attorneys, and some of you may be in the room, that I'm not supposed to say the pandemic is over, so I won't. But we are looking forward. If you had the unfortunate occurrence to hear me speak in the last couple of months, you'll hear me talk a lot about the future, the future of cities, the future of regions, where we're going, the fact that there are going to be winners and losers, um, a very un-Minnesotan concept, but there, like, there are. Like, there are going to be cities that win, in this new economy and this recovery, and cities that lose. And the cities that have a foundation, that have civic leadership, that come together to envision what the next generation of their economy and their city can be are gonna be the winners. I've got good news for this room. 
the city of Bloomington is as well suited as any city in the country to do just that. So when I think about you know, the work that we do together and the work that the chamber does in bringing businesses together and partnering with the city and in driving advocacy, I think about the fact that there's never been a more important time and a more important opportunity to leverage public policy and advocacy into the future. You know, we talk a lot about unprecedented, unprecedented pandemic, unprecedented recovery, unprecedented public sector financial opportunity into the future. All of those things are true. What are we gonna do with it? I'm exceedingly proud that the Chamber has helped lead in the advocacy space in partnership with so many organizations, many of you in the room. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of them for a brief moment. You know, one is the Groundbreak Coalition. If you're not familiar with it, it's a group that was headed by the McKnight Foundation that's really focused on enhancing some of the challenges that we face in our disparities in this region and in our communities. We know that we have those in Bloomington. We're going to hear about those today. And focused on how do we you know, lift up BIPOC entrepreneurs? How do we create more opportunity for housing? How do we create commercial opportunity in our region and in this city? The Chamber is the lead advocacy organization showing up at the Capitol, helping to advance public policy that's going to drive that. And we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of investment and opportunity, and we should be talking about that with a 18 to 20 billion dollar surplus, a once in a generation surplus. This is one of the only rooms that I get to stand in front of and talk about the 2027 Expo without having to explain what it is. It's a big freaking deal. We have the chance to bring the world to the United States for the first time in a generation right here in Bloomington, Minnesota and the Minneapolis-St. Paul region. The chamber has been privileged to serve as a fiscal agent to the, the host committee, as an advocate and as a partner, um, and selfishly as somebody who's gotten to go to Paris a lot. It's been awesome. Um, this is a big deal for our region. It's a big deal for our country and it's something that this community, linking arms and rallying together, should be proud of, the effort that we put into this, and we're gonna win in June. Two last things when we think about the future. You know, the CHIPS Act, which you may or may not be familiar with, but I know that there are some semiconductor folks in the room today, right? That's right. You, know, you in Bloomington know we have a semiconductor industry because it's concentrated right here in Bloomington. Um, it's, it's a great history for this state. There are 52 billion federal dollars available that are going to be matched dollar for dollar with local money across the country in the next 9 to 18 months. We have the opportunity to capture that and turn that into 10,000 jobs and billions of dollars of investment right here in our city and our region. We're going to do that. A couple of days ago, the governor and legislative leadership put a half a billion dollars in their joint targets for a federal match to do that exact thing. It's not enough. So for anybody listening, we're gonna ask them for more, but it's a really good start. And to that unprecedented message, it's an unprecedented message, investment from this state in the future of our economy. And to that point, beyond CHIPS, there's $1.9 trillion of federal funding out of the pandemic that's gonna be invested to create the next generation of our economy. That's all going to happen in the next 12 months, before the next legislative cycle. Our opportunity is right now to capture that, to position it. And I'm going to close where I started. And that's in that there is no city in the region, in the state, in the country that is better positioned than the city of Bloomington to capitalize on that opportunity and write the future. So what you all came for is our state of the city, so I'm going to kick that off, I'm told, right now. The Avant Garde is a music, arts, and entertainment production company that gives exposure to local talent, and it is putting light on the genre of urban eclectic entertainment. The city of Bloomington contacted me and wanted to partner with the avant-garde of my youth group, Hip Hop History and the Arts, to be a part of their diversification initiative. So I was like, what should I name this? 
and it ended up being on the one. So it went from an open mic to a music festival. And so far, so good. It's been going amazing. Yeah, support local. Um, there's some local food trucks, nice atmosphere, good music, you know and lots of fun. Pockets, having money ain't a problem, but you got a lot of options. You know, as a small business, especially a small black owned business, um, to be involved with the city, and I know the city of Bloomington has been making some headway into its diversity and inclusion efforts. You know, this event is one of the things. So to be here and to uh, represent not only my community, uh, but to represent community well, take a part in something that represents my community, typically doing it in an environment that we're not always in out here in Bloomington. And then at the same time, you know, it's just food and music. I mean, that's the one place you can go where it doesn't matter what walk of life you're from, what you do. Everybody wants to come together and have a good time. The partnership with Bloomington is a very unique and amazing one because we both have the same initiative, and that is bringing people to a higher level of consciousness through art, through music, and diversifying. We feel that music and the arts is a great way to bring people together, a great way to just make our commonalities come together. And the future of the city of Bloomington is looking very, very bright.
Oh my goodness, it's so good to be around each and every one of you. So good to come together. Give it up for Chadwick Niles Phillips for having me today. So happy to be here for the State of the City of the Recap. My name is Krishana. God bless you. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Krishana. Let's give her another round of applause. That's fantastic. Last summer, Krishana was one of the featured performers at Bloomington's inaugural On the One Festival. And the On the One Festival was produced by Chadwick Phillips. He was just here. There he is over there. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Avant Garde. Mark your calendars for the second annual Bloomington On the One Festival, Saturday, August 26th at the Normandale Lake Band Shell. Should be a good time. It is so good to be around all of you. I am so happy to see everybody. My name is Tim Bussey. I have the honor and the privilege of serving as the mayor of the city of Bloomington. Welcome to Bloomington's 2023 State of the City Address. Boy, all the people, the lights, the cameras, just the energy in the room, this must be what it's like to be at a Booker Hodges press conference, right? <laughs> I joke, Booker is doing a fantastic job. Thank you, Chief. And he, Booker, despite being the chief, he's a cop's cop. He really is a cop. And, and he puts himself in dangerous situations. Just last week, we were at an event together, and I made the mistake of getting between Booker and a television camera. And then... <laughs> That is not a mistake you make twice. Let me tell you that for free. This is my second State of the City address in person. And uh, last year, we, we was a great to get back together, as Jonathan said. Great to get back together. This year, I decided I wanted to take a little more, you know, a little more hands-on approach. So I, I made a point. I, tried, I wrote the script for this year. And I give the communication staff credit. They, they didn't change one word in the script. And that one word that they didn't change, I think it's on slide 23, be on the lookout for it. As always, a lot of, do we have first timers who have never been at this event before? You're gonna love this event, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I mean, we've got music, obviously, we had wonderful music there. We're gonna have inspirational stories, laughter, tears, some bad attempts at humor, Speeches that go on too long and drag this entire program out. So in other words, it's going to be just like a Bloomington City Council meeting. <laughs> Which means buckle in, we got five hours to go, clear your calendar. <laughs> We're just going to slide right into happy hour from here, okay? More seriously, folks, it is fantastic to see everybody here. Also, welcome to everybody who's joining us on Facebook today. I want to thank, once again, all of the sponsors for today's event. The organizations listed on this screen, they play an enormous role in making this community what it is. And it goes beyond their sponsorship today, which of course we appreciate, but these organizations show up. These organizations, they're part of the foundational bedrock that is what, based on what is all, is all of good in Bloomington. And I want to thank every one of them. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for your sponsorship today. I greatly appreciate it. And speaking of showing up, we're building a connected, welcoming community, thanks in large part to a number of people who put in long hours and do outstanding work. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the members of the Bloomington City Council. Our newest council member is Sa Mua. Sa, give a wave. Sa so was appointed to fill the at-large council seat vacated when Councilmember Nathan Coulter was elected to the State uh, House of Representatives last fall. I think Nathan said he wanted to be here, but he said he'd be watching, so thank you, Nathan, for your service. Councilmember Mua joins Councilmember Dwayne Lohman, who I saw here earlier, Dwayne Lohman. He's in District 1. Councilmember Sean Nelson is in District 2. Councilmember Lona D'Alessandra. Lona D'Alessandro, there it is. She's in District 3. 
Patrick Martin represents District 4, and Jenna Carter is our council member at large. So uh, thanks to all of them for the outstanding work that they do. I also want to specifically recognize and thank our school board in the city of Bloomington here. Uh, talk about a group that shows up. There they are in, in entirety, basically, right there. And uh, being mayor and being in city government for the past four years has been difficult. I would not have been on a school board for the past four years, not even close. They do great work, and we owe them a lot. So thank you all so very much for your service. My friends, over the course of our talk this afternoon, you're going to hear from me and from City Manager Jamie Verbrugge that the state of our city is strong. Our theme this year is focused on Bloomington's new community-based strategic plan called Bloomington Tomorrow Together. I'm sure most of you have been part of a strategic planning process, and you know it's never a small task. And that was certainly the case with Bloomington Tomorrow Together. Hundreds of community members and the city staff were involved in bringing this plan to life. The conversation was open to everyone through focus groups, discussion, and online feedback. A core team of community members and city staff set the course for the plan. Action teams identified steps to take to that would achieve the goals we were looking for, and they truly took to heart the notion that plotting a course for a successful and strong Bloomington tomorrow takes all of us working together today. Thank you to everyone who volunteered their time and brought an abundance of passion to the creation of the strategic plan, especially the core planning team. You see these folks here. We spent 40 hours over four days to make this plan a reality. They put in a lot of work, and I really appreciate the work that they did put into it. The work resulted in an aspirational and an inspirational mission that's as distinctive as the community it represents, to cultivate an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. We're going to dig into that mission statement in just a minute here. Working from that mission, along with working along with uh, agreed on core values, strategic objectives and strategies created by the community-based planning groups, city staff is working to put together a work plan with priority, er priority areas and desired outcomes. We'll be talking about all of that in the coming weeks. We hope to have an online dashboard up and running by the summer so you'll be able to see our progress. Stay tuned. It's going to be a lot of work. But this wouldn't be a state of the city address if we didn't take a minute to reflect on the accomplishments of the past year. Let's take a look at the highlights of 2022. Saying goodbye to the years past brings with it a time to celebrate our accomplishment and reflect on what makes this community truly remarkable. In Bloomington, we had a busy year with many milestones, accomplishments, and events that gifted us a sense of connection amidst the busyness of life. <laughs> 2022 marked the Bloomington Fire Department's 75th year of service and a celebration with the community. The Bloomington Police Department brought back the tradition of hosting open houses and celebrates 70 years of service in 2023. We connected with and answered your questions at a total of six town hall forums across the city with each of your elected city officials. Neighbors enjoyed their time with other neighbors at events like Kites and Bites, Summer Fet, the Farmer's Market, and the Penn Lake Celebration. And the second annual Bloomington Pride brought thousands of community members together for a remarkable day of belonging. The city established the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging to build organizational capacity to address systemic inequalities and support systems change throughout the organization. And the third cohort of Bloomington's pioneers and changemakers was announced in February of 2023 with an event honoring current and past recipients. Parks and Recreation aimed to make soccer more accessible and connect families by hosting its first camp in partnership with Three Rivers Park District, Patagonia Visual Solutions, and a grant paid for by the Metropolitan Council. Creative Placemaking brought voices together for its first hometown poetry contest, highlighting local talent. And the streets of Bloomington had been beautified with the additions of Blooming Ribbon and Street Seat. Bloomington Roadways saw many updates, including five safety improvement projects through the city's pavement management program. There were also safety improvements at 98th and Normandale, at the intersection of Old Shakopee Road and Xerxes Avenue, and the final phase of the 106th Street project was completed. The Orange and D bus rapid transit lines opened, connecting people to job centers, housing options, and transit stations across the region. 
Winstead Way was unveiled in honor of Bloomington's longest serving mayor, Gene Winstead. And at the core of a remarkable community is health and safety. Thanks to the SAFER grant, the city is hiring 18 new full-time firefighters. Changes to curbside cleanup means less waste, bringing the first ever citywide recycling drop-off event, garden tool swap, and compost giveaway, and the trial of a bulky item collection with partner Better Futures Minnesota. And curbside organics kicked off with a bang. Since it began one year ago, 5,600 Bloomington households have signed up for the service and have diverted more than 1,000 tons of food scraps and other organic materials from the garbage stream. City staff, along with a number of community partners, hosted energy resource nights, helping residents lower costs and connect with resources. And a place that started as a bold idea celebrated a major milestone. The Mall of America turned 30. 2022 was truly a remarkable year. We had a busy year, and our work has put Bloomington into a prime position for an exciting future in the coming years and beyond. I want to go back, if I could, to the mission statement for just a minute. And without going full eighth grade English class and identifying the different parts of speech in this statement, I do want to take a minute to highlight some words and ideas that stand out. And the first is cultivate. I've shared in the past that I'm a gardener. We have other gardeners here in the, in the audience, gardeners. Soon, my friends, all we have to do is get rid of two feet of snow and at least 18 inches of frost, and the time will be ours. I promise it's coming. If you're a gardener here in Minnesota, you know full well the importance of cultivation. Successful gardeners don't just stand back and wait to see what happens, they cultivate. And cultivate is a verb, it's an action word. There's soil preparation, choosing the right seeds and plants, getting your hands in the dirt, weeding, maybe adding a bit of manure now and then. Now if you remember the state of the city in the past years, uh, the former mayor would shamelessly show pictures of his grandchildren. I don't have any grandkids yet, but I do have my gardens, so I'll have to settle for same, shamelessly showing off pictures of my gardens and, and figure that will work. It doesn't matter if you're cultivating a garden or if you're cultivating an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be, it just doesn't happen. It takes a lot of hard work. And Bloomington is putting that hard work in, in both our businesses and our people. We continue to have one of the strongest economic development track records in the region. Throughout 2022 and into this year, the city continued to redevelop with a number of new developments and property renovations. In 2022, the city had more than $131 million of additional assessed value due to new construction. Construction on the new Bloomington Fire Station 4 is almost complete and is set to open later this spring. The city also continues to advance the council's goal of adding new housing in Bloomington. 1,634 new units have opened since 2020. An additional 2,061 new units are under construction or have been approved for future construction. Of these 3,700 new units, over 770 are affordable. Major companies like Seagate, Walzer Toyota, and Verizon Wireless started expansion projects or received approval to expand their facilities. A new top-line credit union is currently under construction, and most notably, Six sensors completed phase one of its new facility in the South Loop, with additional phases or expansions being planned. And with the projects we have slated for construction in 2023, the city is expected to again add over $100 million in total market value. And there is more good news. Europolis, one of Bloomington's iconic locally owned businesses, yes, absolutely. They are about to triple in size with a 2,400 square foot expansion to their existing building at Penn and 90th. The new construction will include demolition of the old gas station. Can I get an amen? Construction will start soon and is projected to be complete in 2024. The city of Bloomington partnered with Europolis by putting together a tax and community financing district brokering a grant, a grant agreement with the Minnesota Department of Econ Employment and Economic Development, and moving on several policy changes that have made it easier to expand the indoor and dining outdoor seating areas. It's fantastic that Europolis is making an investment in their 
business and in the community. Congratulations to them, we're very happy for them. This project is a great example of what we can do when the city and our local businesses work together and strategically use the tools at our disposal. Bloomington and our partners at McGuff have been working for more than a decade to cultivate the South Loop area into, the neighbor, into a neighborhood. The area is served by light rail transit, Bloomington Central Station includes a great park and a gathering space, and there are now more than 2,000 housing units either under construction or existing in close walking distance. The one thing that was missing was a grocery store. So we are so looking forward to welcoming a new Oxendales grocery store to Bloomington as part of the Carbon 31 apartment development at 8131st Avenue South. It's a couple of blocks east of the Mall of America in Bloomington Central Station. Carbon 31 is a six-story project that will include 404 residential units and 15,000 square feet of retail, including a grocery store and a liquor store. Construction is underway, should wrap up later this year or early in 2024. We want to congratulate our friends and our partners at McGuff for the work that they have done out at Bloomington Central Station. And if we're talking about Bloomington's economy, we absolutely need to talk about our exceptional hospitality industry. I'm happy to report that after several tough years, visitors are coming back to Bloomington. The lodging occupancy data at the end of 2022 tells this story. Though still short of the pre-pandemic numbers of 2019, Bloomington's hotel occupancy was just under 62% last year. As you can see, we are in line with overall U.S. occupancy rates, and we outperformed uh, Minneapolis, or the Minnesota rate, as well as the occupancy rates in Duluth, St. Paul, and Minneapolis. For our friends here today from the hospitality industry, we see you. Thank you for enduring the tough times. Congratulations on making it through, and we look forward to our continued collaboration with our hotels, our restaurants, our bars, and attractions. As mayor, I am proud of this community for a number of reasons, but I think I'm most proud of our commitment to helping create housing that people can afford right here in Bloomington. Having a place to call home is such an important factor when it comes to a person's well-being and success in life. No matter where you are or who you are, decent, affordable housing provides a solid foundation for everything else that goes on. Having a stable home generates, uh, it generally equates to more economic success, better education outcomes, and a better quality of life. That's why we've been working hard to make Bloomington a place where people can afford to live. Through our Opportunity Housing Ordinance and our Affordable Housing Trust Fund, Bloomington works very closely with developers to provide housing that people can afford, and that means people in our hospitality industry. That means our first-year teachers. That means people working as technicians in our technology businesses. Now, each decade, the Metropolitan Council sets affordable housing goals for cities across the Twin Cities. The most recent numbers show that Bloomington is now at 86% of its 2030 affordable housing goal as set by the Metropolitan Council. <laughs> Bloomington's leadership in this area is impressive, and as leaders, we have the responsibility to lead. That impressive number of 86%, I think it's pretty safe to say that we are about 86% ahead of most of our neighboring communities in the Twin Cities. <laughs> Providing housing that people can afford is a regional issue, but there are far too many communities that have decided, for whatever reason, that they're going to sit this one out, that affordable housing isn't something that they want to deal with. Former Mayor Gene Winstead was known for saying, we do a really good job of admiring a problem. It's time to stop admiring this problem, and it's time for all communities to get to work on this. We in Bloomington will continue to do the heavy lifting. We get the work done. That's what we do. But I'm calling on our neighbors, on every neighbor in, uh, around Bloomington, every city in the metropolitan area, to get busy and actually do something on affordable housing in their communities. Cultivating and enduring a remarkable community where businesses want to be is an important task. And I'm excited at, about the momentum and solid work that we have underway here in Bloomington in the area of economic development. Last fall, the council approved a restructuring of the Housing and Redevelopment Authority and our Port Authority in a way that refocused their work to better serve Bloomington's housing and economic development goals. For three decades, the Bloomington Port Authority has very successfully worked to expand the city's tax base, promote and attract quality job opportunities, and support real estate redevelopment and economic development. 
The restructuring expands the Port Authority's role to more actively include business development, expansion, and retention. And it restructures staff to make these positions, to make the positions a priority. And of course, the Chamber of Commerce is a vital partner in all of these efforts. I want to take a moment to thank Jonathan and all the folks here from the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce for your leadership and for being here with us today. Thank you so very much. Over the past year, we cut ribbons here in Bloomington on a number of new places, including Home Two Suites, True by Hilton at Mall of America, the Total Wine Reopening, B&B Theaters at Mall of America, and Laughing Waters Spa at Radisson Blue Mall of America. And as mentioned in the video earlier, one of the significant recent achievements was the uh, ribbon cutting of SIC, AG. SIC is a German company that produces optical sensors. They've been in Bloomington for more than 25 years, but recently reinvested and consolidated, and their new facility is now their North American headquarters. The building we cut the ribbon on is their first phase of four phases that we hope to see occur on the site. And in all, 24 new businesses became new members of the chamber this past year. And as we welcomed these new businesses and celebrated these reinvestments, we also said a sad goodbye to one longtime beloved restaurant here in Bloomington. not want to be the guy who put a closed sign on the door at the last minute and says thanks for your support and, and leave it at that. I'm Edward Fong. Most people know me as Ed Fong. I'm a second generation to the David Fong's restaurant. I was uh, two months old when my parents started the business. My parents started out in 1958 at a location that they found on Old Chocopee and Lindale. Eight years later we opened up this location at 9329 Lindale, just four blocks from the original store. My father was actually a draftsman by trade, and you see the red awnings around the building and inside the building are actually designed by him. I actually still have the original drawings of my father's. We were warmly welcomed into the community, and that's how we started putting our roots down. My parents started out with four items in takeout, and that was the chicken chow mein, egg foo young, fried rice, and egg rolls. My parents always said, you know, you have to give back to the community for them to support you. And so from the very beginning, we've always been a very community-oriented. We support Lions Clubs, some of the other charitable organizations that are in the area. And the schools is a big part of it, too, for education. I mean, all those things that make a community, we want to support those to make the, our community stronger. For us, the stronger the community for where we were at made it that much more viable for us to stay in business. Thank you, Bloomington and everybody else from around the country that have come back to uh, say thanks and, and uh, wishing me good luck on my retirement. <laughs> gentlemen, David Fong and his son Don are here with us today. <laughs> David, on behalf of countless customers that you've served through several generations, Thank you, and thank you to your entire family for 64 years of not only providing great service and exceptional food to our community, but for your generosity and support of Bloomington over all of these years. Congratulations on your retirement. Well done. <laughs> to cultivate new businesses and to uplift uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, work is underway on a new Bloomington Small Business Development Center in the old fire station number three on East 86th Street. A small business resource of this type was a top priority in our city survey of businesses, and it's great to see the project is moving forward. We've hired an architect. There's an advisory committee that's been working to develop recommendations on operations and programming and branding. And the city has sought out and received funding from a variety of uh, sources, including Hennepin County, the McKnight Foundation, and the American Rescue Plan. A very important goal of this project is to support the entrepreneurial efforts of underrepresented groups, women-owned businesses, youth, and artists. But I want to be perfectly clear. The resources and services available at the Small Business Development Center will be available to any business in Bloomington who is either starting, looking to expand, or looking to improve their business. Construction is expected to begin in September, and we hope to open early next year. And while we're cultivating our business community, we also need to be sure that we cultivate the people 
working in those businesses. Last summer, the City Council unanimously approved an earned sick and safe leave ordinance that ensures that workers in Bloomington have the right and the ability to take time off for their health and safety. It provides an option for employees so that they don't have to make the choice between losing wages or going to work sick. The ordinance goes into effect on July 1st of this year, and the city will be, encouraging the or will be engaging the business community on the impacts and the implement implementation steps of this ordinance throughout the course of the year. Another initiative that I'm very excited about is the Bloomington Workforce Steering Committee. It's a public-private partnership between the city of Bloomington and regional businesses and academic leaders with the goal of creating 12,000 high-paying jobs in Bloomington by 2027. The committee's goal is to position Bloomington as a hub of innovation and talent for future and to support the training and upskilling of tomorrow's workforce through internships, apprenticeships, and proven training programs. Thanks to the committee members for their commitment to advancing this important initiative. And one final workforce effort I want to bring to your attention is our new Bloom in Bloomington program. There have been discussions for a couple of years about the need for programming for young people in our community. And our Community Development Racial Equity Action Team had a goal to develop a formal internship program. After several meetings, we thought, who better to develop an internship than an intern, right? Priscilla Moyawa was hired as project manager and worked alongside city staff to create Bloom in Bloomington. It's a program that strives to support and grow a more diverse and accessible workforce for our community by matching young people with employers in uh, local government, nonprofit, and the private sector. The new internship program will kick off this summer. We're looking forward to it. Priscilla is here with us today. I wanted to make sure that we, there she is. We wanted to say congratulations and thank you. So if you're gonna cultivate something, common sense says you have to make it enduring. That's the next piece of the mission that I wanna talk about. We're certainly working for today, but we also have the responsibility to ensure that our work can stand the test of time and that it can sustain the community for years to come into the future. And to make anything endure requires strategic thinking, commitment and buy-in by the entire community, and it takes the necessary investment. Back in January, the City Council approved a resolution formally requesting permission to hold a referendum authorizing a local sales tax here in Bloomington. According to an independent analysis by the University of Minnesota Extension Service, this local sales tax would generate about $12 million a year for 20 years. The half-cent sales tax would fund three capital projects, the renovation of the Bloomington Ice Garden, the construction of a new community health and wellness center, and a strategic renewal of the Nine Mile Creek Corridor. Using a sales tax to fund these projects, 60% of the cost would be paid for by visitors to Bloomington, and 40% would be paid for by Bloomington residents. The typical cost for a Bloomington household would be about $70 to $100 each year. But if these same projects were paid for through a property tax levy, the property tax bill for the median value home in Bloomington would increase by about $230 a year. So if this request is approved by the legislature, the next steps would be for the Bloomington voters to vote on each one of these projects at our next election, which would be in this November. We made a lot of progress in sustainability in 2022. Community engagement was high for city-coordinated events that aid in restoration efforts, such as a garlic mustard pole and a buckthorn bust. In 2022, the city launched two energy disclosure programs to address climate change, with more than 1,000 households and 85 of Bloomington's largest buildings participating. Also last year, the city introduced a curbside organics recycling program. As of February, more than 5,600 homes were composting curbside. And we completed a large restoration project on Oxborough Lake and kicked off a project to improve the health of Penn Lake. And I'd like to recognize one of our youth leaders, Sustainability Commissioner Owen Loken is here with us today. Where's Owen? There's Owen. <laughs> Owen is a senior at Jefferson High School. Thank you for your service on the commission. Appreciate it, Owen. In 2021, the City Council adopted a park system master plan that guides park improvements and sets priorities for what's included in parks. And in 2022, staff went back out into the community to get input on individual park plans for nine different parks. We hosted ice cream socials in July and September and presented two scenarios for each of the nine parks. The final drafts of the con conceptual plan for Bryant and Tretbaugh Park is currently being presented to the community and those two parks are scheduled to be worked on in 2024. The plans do a great job of incorporating natural resources, trails, and new park amenities, which are top priority themes from the Park System Master Plan. 
We also learned that Bloomington will receive $2.35 million in federal funds to construct a key section of the Minnesota Valley State Trail that runs along the Minnesota River. The new section will run between Lindale Avenue and Nine Mile Creek. The Minnesota State Trail is a 13-mile tra trail that extends from the Bloomington Ferry Bridge to the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge Visitors Center when it's complete. And from the time that this, the first segment opened and it was open to users, the use and the demand for this trail absolutely exceeded expectations. And I think it shows the demand for this type of accessible, high quality, recreational, multi-use trail that's available to everyone. It also shows there's plenty of room for everyone and all different uses in the Minnesota River Valley. Now while it's always fun to talk about these exciting recreational kind of things, we also need to talk about the nuts and bolts kind of projects that are necessary to cultivate an enduring community, including the 494 project. <laughs> We've been talking about it and planning for it for a number of years and construction is scheduled to begin this summer on this $300 million project. The project includes the 494-35W interchange improvements with a northbound to westbound flyover ramp, easy pass lanes in both directions between East Bush Lake Road and 35W, bridge reconstruction of Nicollet, Portland, and 12th to prepare for the easy pass to the east, and a new pedestrian bridge at Chicago Avenue. And out of necessity, the project is also going to require a lot of patience, a lot of understanding, and a lot of leaving yourself a little extra time to get where you're going over the next three years. Bloomington and our partners continue to look for funding for future phases of the project so we can get this project done and done right the first time. And speaking of a project that was done right, the 106th Street project between Lindale Avenue and Oak Grove Middle School was completed in 2022. The project improved local street connections uh, and to the new bridge, the 35W bridge over 106th Street. It also included safety improvements with improved sight lanes, reduced conflict points, and improved bike and pedestrian facilities. And because I have you here today, I want to remind you all once again that the Bloomington Remembers Veterans Group is working with the city to build a veterans memorial on the east lawn of the Civic Plaza. The memorial design captures the themes of honor, reflection, education, community, and, and the future. And the Bloomington Remembers Veterans Group is accepting donations for this. Don't forget them, please. The final part of the mission statement that I want to focus on is the word remarkable. Now here in, here in Bloomington, we get the work done. That's what we do. That's not remarkable. That's what all cities should be doing. When it snows, we plow the streets. Our police department is fantastic. Uh, our parks keep getting better and better, and our drinking water is absolutely second to none. We do city services very well, which gives us the opportunity to think big and bold and look for ways that we can be remarkable. And item A1 on that list of remarkable is Expo 2027. The last time the United States hosted an expo or a World's Fair was in 1984 in New Orleans. It's time for the U.S. to host this important economic, diplomatic, and cultural event once again, and the place to host it is right here in Bloomington. <laughs> the theme couldn't be more timely, healthy people, healthy planet. Minnesota is the perfect place to showcase the future of health and wellness for all. And a World's Fair in Bloomington would have a tremendous economic impact on, in Minnesota. First, with uh, projected 13.3 million attendees over 93 days in the summer of 2027, the Expo would certainly be a huge boon for our hospitality industry. And with almost 90% of Expo attendees coming from outside the Twin Cities, that economic impact would be felt far and wide. It's estimated that Expo 2027 would generate $364 million of tax revenue to support state, local, and federal governments, and would support more than 17,000 jobs right here in Minnesota. And finally, I make it clear to people, we're not just building tents and pole barns here. The expectation is that the majority of the infrastructure built for the Expo would be built to be reused in some way, shape, or form. We're in the home stretch of this bid to host Expo 2027. Minnesota and the United States are competing against Spain, Thailand, Serbia, and Argentina. And despite being cautioned about being overly optimistic last week, I'm going to tell you I'm very confident. I think we are going to, I think we are going to uh, land Expo 2027, and I think it's coming to Minnesota. I can say that because I'm the mayor. I can say that kind of thing. That's fine. <laughs> the vote to decide things will take place on June 21st, and we need you to keep your fingers crossed.
When we were together this time last year, we talked about a proposed water park at the Mall of America, and we're here talking about it again, but with a different set of circumstances. The rising cost of construction and materials and the tightening financial markets make this an ongoing discussion. I continue to believe that the project would be very successful and that by drawing a million visitors per year, it would be a great benefit to Bloomington's hospitality industry, which, by the way, continues to contribute about 20% of the city's revenues over the course of the year, which obviously brings down tax burden for Bloomington businesses and residents across the city. And it's for that reason that we've pledged tax increment financing support to this project. TIF is routinely used to get projects over the hump, and decades of history shows that TIF actually works very well in Minnesota. The lion's share of this financing would go to infrastructure, public improvements that are traditionally funded by TIF, including roads, infrastructure, and parking. This is another example of, a, of an aggressive public-private partnership that maximizes benefits to the city while minimizing risks as much as possible. Stay tuned. If financing is available to be secured and the financing gap is closed, the project could, schedule, could be scheduled to begin this fall. And it goes without saying, but big projects aren't what make this community remarkable. It's the big-hearted people who live here. And there are no shortage of remarkable people in our community, people who are soaring to new heights, people who have made impressive achievements on a grand scale, and the exceptional neighbors among us who give of themselves to make a difference in other people's lives. It was crazy, it was wild, it was beyond what I ever expected it to be. I started training full-time two years ago for this, and it's a little hard to train for mountains in Minnesota. <laughs> Did laps on Highland Hill every day, hour after hour. I was in Colorado all summer, <laughs> and I was there uh, setting the self-supported Colorado 14er record. A 14er is a mountain, and there are 58 mountains in Colorado that are taller than 14,000 feet. Just another day in 14er paradise. In order to break the record, I had to climb 58 mountains that were taller than 14,000 feet in 14 days, 17 hours, and 33 minutes. That day that they called and said, you make it, you know, there was a lot of people here in the house. Those people was happy, bro, was happy and crying at the same time, you know. <laughs> that was beautiful, it's, it's beautiful. And they were thinking, especially when, the, when I signed that someday I go be in Cooperstown or I go be, be Hall of Fame. I contribute a lot to my attitude. I think I have a special attitude to help me to get through the other stuff. Everybody knows they can go to Ed if they, they need a ride somewhere. As long as they don't tell me, make a right turn left turn. Or they need a partner to play cards or whatever. You feel good and you make friends. You'd be surprised how many friends you got. He's 96 and he was in World War II in the Navy. And I thought it would be good for people in Bloomington, older people in Bloomington, to see how well someone's doing after going through all that. Any place I go, they go out the way sometimes, they see me in the store and see any place they turn, congratulations, you, congratulations. You. I can't believe it. All those people was waiting for that moment. They loved me before, but now they have the opportunity to say, we did it as a team. We did it. Life can be good in your old age. It doesn't have to be boring or dull. I'm at peace. That's why I always tell my lifelong friends. I think most folks could do something like this if they tried. I'm a middle-aged guy from Minnesota with kids and, and I made it happen. Live your dreams, they can happen for you. Now, Tonio is down at spring training, but both Dan and Edward are here with us today. If you gentlemen could stand, where, there's Ed, where's, where's Dan? Where's Dan?
I hope you have all had a chance to meet Don Heinzman. Don is right down here. He is a local retired journalist, and he always has great ideas. Don put out a request on Facebook for nominations of notable Bloomington residents for a project that he was working on. He said he expected about 10 nominations. He ended up with more than 70. Gene Belfi, the curator of the Bloomington Historical Society, saw his Facebook post and noticed that people were mostly mentioning Bloomington athletes. She thought she'd add some variety to this mix and nominated her previous neighbor, Mary Grand, uh, Grandpre, who illustrated the US versions of the Harry Potter books. And so a working partnership was born. Together, Don and Jean researched, wrote, and designed pages for three volumes of more than 100 Bloomington notables. The collection is housed at the Bloomington Historical Society. I encourage you, go and take a look because it is really cool. It's remarkable and it includes people ranging from Tony Oliva to past mayor Jim Lindau to Tom Burnett. Thank you to Don and to Jean. Thanks for your work. I'm honored to be part of this community and city organizations made up of inf influential leaders who are achieving greatness in their careers and the work that they do for others. This year, at-large council member Jenna Carter and Normandale Black Men in Teaching Program Coordinator Marvis Kilgore, Marvis is right over there, they were named 40 Under 40 honorees by Minneapolis and St. Paul Business Journal. City of Bloomington's Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer Faith Jackson, she is right over there. She was named Finance and Chambers Rising Young Professional. Where did she go? Oh, I'm sorry, she's over there. <laughs> Uh, now you messed me up, Faith. Here we go. <laughs> and resident Tara Owens was honored with the Omar Bondarud Award for Human Rights. She has a passion for creating community and connection in her work, leading the Todd Pod and the Early Learning Advisory Council, er, early, early Learning Advisory Council here in Bloomington. And City of Bloomington Deputy City Attorney Peter Zuniga. Peter, I think, was right back there. There he is. <laughs> He was named a 2023 in-house counsel honoree by Minnesota Lawyer, one of only 16 Minnesota attorneys who received the honor this year. Another landmark time here in Bloomington, happy 60th anniversary to the Bloomington Symphony Orchestra. Since 1963, the BSO has been providing orchestral musical for, music for the Bloomington community and has offered opportunities for area instrumentalists to develop their musical skills. It's made up of talented amateur and freelance professional musicians BSO performs several classical programs each year. You probably have seen them perform at the Lake Normandale Band Shell, including performances at the city's July 3rd Summerfest celebration. Congratulations on 60 years in the community. That is music to our ears. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> and one more bit of accolade. We know that quality schools draw families to Bloomington, contributing to a vibrant and thriving community, and Bloomington Public Schools provide remarkable opportunities for all of our learners. The district's re Renaissance project is funded by one of 13 U.S. Department of Education grants. It focuses on early identification of giftedness in underrepresented students, including students of color, economically disadvantaged, multilingual learners, and children with disabilities. The school district is a leader in the K-12 computer science education world for all. The district's new Code Academy is a full-time online K-12 school certified by the Minnesota Department of Education and open to students from anywhere in Minnesota. The Bloomington Career and College Academy offers pathways to careers and college level courses in information technology, healthcare, criminal justice, and law enforcement, and more. We're happy to mention that two BPS graduates who went through this program are now two Bloomington police officers. And Bloomington Public Schools is proud to have 10 teachers included in the field of 131 for Education Minnesota's Teacher of the Year Award program this year and three advanced to the semifinal round. So congratulations to all of our schools and school district and everybody of the great work that's going on. It was former President Barack Obama who said, change is brought about because ordinary people do extraordinary things. There are many individuals and organizations in this community doing extraordinary things. People helping those in need and giving their time, like volunteers with wonderful organizations like Veep, Cornerstone, The Red, and Bridging. And sometimes it's just about providing remarkable service 
and taking time to recognize and to thank our community helpers. Monster trucks. Theodore is four. This one is called Dragon. Frederick is two. They love trucks. Then we put monster trucks right here. Wednesdays are our favorite days in our house. They pick up the garbage. They like to watch the trash go in. We, in the spring, we're talking about how we can just be more present in our community and what we can do to talk to our community members. And both of the boys really wanted to thank our community helpers. So we talked about who our community helpers were and our garbage collector was the top person on the list. They're both like, we need to thank this guy. So we got out the crayons, got out the markers, and they wrote a little thank you note. Theodore came out one day when I was picking up here and he had drawn a picture of me and, and him and he gave it to me and I was taken by that. And they were psyched, they were starstruck. And we talked about it nonstop for the next week. I love it, it's greatly appreciated. It's really nice having customers that go beyond that you know, extra step of just saying, oh, thanks for the good service. When he said that his name was Paul, our boys started calling him Mr. Paul. So our trash collector is known to us as Mr. Paul, very lovingly. <laughs> Every day we get a tablet, all my routes on it, and on top of the tablet now it has Mr. Paul. I like it. Every Wednesday morning when I come here, they're always out by the window waving, smiling. They can't wait till I get here. It's just really special. It's nice to know that we have great community helpers here in Bloomington. It's just really great to know that we have an excellent community here. Please join me in recognizing Mr. Paul Bogarty's right over there. And the residents who were uh, with the, the charming young boys uh, were Saw and Shauna Mua. Congratulations, that's great. <laughs> My friends, I started by saying that the state of our city is strong. Our future is bright and we have an amazing plan to create an enduring and remarkable Bloomington together. And as I said in, earlier, here in Bloomington, we get the work done. That's because we have an amazing city staff. I know Jamie's gonna go to, into a bit more detail in just a minute here, but I want to thank every member of our city staff who is here today for the outstanding work that you do every day to make this a remarkable community. So thank you to our Bloomington City staff. The city organization is exceptional and the leadership is among the best. Leading it all is someone who I've had the pleasure of knowing for about 25 years and had the pleasure of working with for the past seven years. Our city manager, Jamie Verbrugge, is recognized as one of the most forward-thinking and effective managers in the state of Minnesota, and he makes it all look effortless. Please welcome to the podium, Bloomington City Manager, Jamie Verbrugge. I don't know if I can bring that much energy. <laughs> so here's where the boring part starts. Uh, I want to thank Mayor Bussey every, every year. He does, this is your second one because the first couple under COVID, we weren't able to do this much uh, fun. So, uh, but each of the years that you have produced a state of the city, uh, we still did it during COVID. He does a fantastic job and I really appreciate your leadership just as I appreciate the leadership of our entire city council. Uh, they're in it for the right reasons. They have wonderful vision and it is absolutely a privilege and a pleasure to work for all seven of them. For th thank, thank you. Uh, I'm Jamie Verbrugge. I'm the Bloomington city manager. Uh, I agree with what Krishana and the mayor both said earlier uh, in saying it is so good to be around you. I mean, this is an incredible room that's here with us today. As the mayor said, the state of our city is strong and our future is bright. And we have a new group of bright and talented new leaders who joined our city organization this past year and I wanna introduce some of them to you. Uh, Holly Masick is our new Port Authority Administrator. Where's Holly at? There she is. <laughs> Christia Davern is our new Facilities Manager. Is Christia with us? I don't see if she was here today. 
Uh, we have Irene Babakani is our new assistant public health administrator. Scott Roth is our new assistant golf course manager. Ian Brecky is our new center for the arts manager. Ian replaces Leah Hughes, who is now our deputy director of parks and recreation. And Tim Bulger is the new city assessor. There's Tim. Now, these are, uh, these are uh, folks in leadership positions in the city. Uh, we have hired more people in the last couple years uh, than we have in years before. We've, we, you know, a lot of you are experiencing this, experiencing this too, right? Is that uh, there's a lot of churn in the marketplace. And so we have been welcoming a lot of new people into the organization. And here's what I will tell you, is that we are attracting incredible, incredible professionals. And each of these people that we have hired, uh, I, am ex I am just incredibly excited to work with in the future. And it's not just at the leadership level, it's at all levels of our organization. Is For those of you who are residents of the city of Bloomington, those of you who have businesses here in Bloomington, I want you to know that you have the absolute best and brightest who are working for you. Now, uh, to run a city operation, of course, we need strong financial management to continue to remain strong and help us achieve much of what you've been hearing about today. And to reaffirm our excellent financial position, I get to once again report that Bloomington has retained its triple, triple A rating, the highest bond ratings from all three of the bond rating agencies. Out of almost 19,500 cities in the United States, there are only 33 that have three triple A's and Bloomington continues to be the only city in Minnesota to have that distinction. This past year, the city of Bloomington was awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association. This award is the highest form of recognition for excellence in state and local government financial reporting. And in order to be awarded a Certificate of Achievement, a government must publish an easily readable and efficiently organized annual comprehensive financial report. This is the 50th year in a row that the city has received this award. That's a milestone that is shared by only one other city and one other county in the entire country. The report is the... The report is the accumulation of all of the city's activities and transactions, and it's the cornerstone to cultivating an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. I want to thank the folks in our finance uh, department especially who work on our annual financial report, who put together fantastic budgets, uh, and who do a, a tremendous job of managing the money uh, that our taxpayers expect us to protect. So thank you to all of them. The Bloomington Fire Department has begun its transformation from a predominantly paid on-call department to a hybrid model of full-time and part-time firefighters to improve response times and to better meet the safety needs in our community. Now, last fall, the fire department, as was noted earlier, learned it received a Staffing for Adequate Fight and Emergency Response, a SAFER grant from FEMA. So those funds uh, will make it possible for us to hire 18 full-time firefighters to better serve Bloomington and provide much needed additional staffing for the department. So the hiring process is complete. All 18 firefighters have accepted their job offers. They start on April 3rd and we're going to introduce them to the community at a council meeting on April 17th. We're very excited to welcome those 18. We have three more coming in July. Uh, so we are ready to move forward with a modern fire department to protect our community. I also want to say congratulations to Bloomington firefighter Jason Rich. He was the recipient of this year's Firefighter of the Year Award. Uh, Jason recently retired after 21 years with the Bloomington Fire Department. So we have a lot to celebrate in 2023. This year also marks the 70th anniversary of the police department. We're going to have an open house that will kick off that celebration. So all of you are invited to come out on May 20th. It'll be 11 to 2 o'clock in the east lot at Civic Plaza. You'll get to see all of the police op op operations uh, on display. 
Visitors will have the opportunity to see um, the SWAT team, although we don't call them SWAT anymore. We call them the Emergency Response Unit now. Um, but, you know, they're still really cool, even if they have a different name. <laughs> Uh, the bomb squad, the K-9 unit, they'll get to tour the police department. You can meet representatives from our patrol division, our crime prevention staff, animal control, reserves, chaplains, explorers, uh, and much more. And uh, I really want to say about our police department, and I, I believe this to my core, we have the best police department in the state of Minnesota. I want to congratulate Deputy Chief Kim Clausen, who just recently graduated from the 284th session of the National FBI Academy. She's one of only a handful of officers in our police department's history to complete this prestigious program. And I also want to acknowledge Officer Matt Ryan. Matt received the Optimist Club Respect for Law Officer of the Year, as well as the Bloomington Police Officer of the Year in 2022. Matt, congratulations. And I want to thank Chief Hodges and the Bloomington Police Department for their excellent work and their rapid response and daily work, um, but especially their response to three high-profile incidents that occurred in Bloomington over the past year. Their efforts to keep our community safe are truly remarkable, and those kinds of events uh, can really have uh, a destabilizing effect on communities, right? And when you see those happen, they can really shake people to our core. But what's really important is when people come to Bloomington and crime, they get caught because our police department, I think, is the best police department in the state of Minnesota. Um, so each of them do tremendous work. Um, I'm also happy to report, as you see on the screen, that crime is down in uh, the year from 21 to 22 by 5%. But this also continues a, th a three-year decline in crime. So the crime in 2022 uh, was 25% less than 2019. I don't know many other communities right now that are experiencing that. This is a safe community. It's an incredibly safe community. And I know for people who may see crime happening or experience crime themselves, that's a hard story to tell. But here I am to tell you that we are a safe community. And it goes beyond the police officers. A lot of the credit goes to our residents because safety in a community begins right in the neighborhood. And the heart of this community are the neighborhoods where people look out for each other, they know each other, they protect each other. And that's a sign of a strong community. One of the priorities of the Bloomington Tomorrow Together plan is a healthy community. It's a lesson learned from COVID-19 that people need better access to health services where they live and learn and work and play. By going into the community, we can improve people's health and reduce persistent disparities. This spring, Bloomington's Public Health Division is rolling out a mobile health hub across the three communities we serve, Bloomington, Edina, and Richfield. And the unit was funded using American Rescue Plan dollars. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, Mayor Bussey was at the White House as part of a group of Minnesotans talking about how the American Rescue Plan has been put to use to benefit communities. This is a prime example of it right here. Offerings will include immunizations, health screenings, nutrition education through the Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC program, and much more. The Public Health Division parts to, uh, plans to partner with our schools and in apartment complexes and other community sites to make its health services more available. And as our community gets more diverse, the city is responding to the changing needs. A new way we are working to improve the community's health is through community health workers. The city's first two bilingual community health workers were hired last year. They are trusted and knowledgeable members of the communities they serve. They'll be embedded in our public health division, cultivating relationships, and help breaking down cultural and linguistic barriers between communities and healthcare systems. An incredibly busy first year, they have provided community education and outreach. They've supported families through home visits and connected residents to vital resources such as health insurance, medical and dental clinics, and household needs. Most of this work has been done in Spanish. All of this work ensures community members have access to the information, the resources, and the opportunities that are available. It will also help the city meet our objectives of improved individual health and ensuring community members feel connected and feel valued. Now, uh, moving on to uh, 
something that people see more often is public works. So we have Public Works Week is coming up May 21st through 27th. To launch that, our Public Works Department is hosting a free public open house on Saturday, May 20th from 9 until 12. So after a three-year hiatus, Public Works staff is revved up to open their doors and bring back equipment rides, uh, demonstrations, interactive displays, snacks, prizes, and other family fun. So on the 20th, if you aren't around the city of Bloomington, you're missing out on something, you know, between the police and the Public Works. Uh, it really is a cool show. So mark your calendar for this opportunity to get to know the people and the equipment that keep Bloomington a great place to live. The mayor referenced this. So much snow. Uh, you've probably seen this viral image circulating this week. Uh, Star Tribune said captures our long, long winter in Minnesota. Uh, or more locally, uh, this image captures our long, long <laughs> winter in Bloomington. Uh, it's a year that already ranks as one of the snowiest on record. In fact, with 81.2 inches of snow, this is the seventh snowiest season on record. And I, along with many other grateful community members, uh, would like to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts put forth by our snow removal teams this year. We hear from many, yeah. We hear from a lot of people who travel this city that Bloomington roads are some of the best maintained anywhere around, and especially so when it comes to ensuring safety during inclement weather. We do hear occasionally from people who are dissatisfied. I actually, so I love this little anecdote. I, I got a call two years ago, the April uh, snowstorm where we had 14 inches. And I had a guy who was really upset because we didn't get his cul-de-sac plowed out by 8 a.m. like usual, it was like 3.30. And I said to him, and I'm looking at uh, Brian Ricks who is the Metropolitan Airport's Commission Executive Director here, I said, look, if the airport was closed down for three hours, I think you can give our guys a little bit of grace on this, okay? <laughs> so every now and then we got somebody who's not happy. But the fact is, we have the data to prove how happy the Bloomington residents are in our snow removal efforts. The 2022 National Community Survey of Bloomington residents, our snow removal received scores of excellent or good from 84% of our residents. That ranked Bloomington in the top 10% of jurisdictions nationwide that asked this question. Uh, removing snow is a difficult task, and this year uh, presented even bigger challenges. Let's take a look. Typically day to day on a snow event, We'd start at 3 or 4 a.m. The crew plows over 2,100 lane miles of road per event. That's not including cul-de-sacs and obviously sidewalks. Usually it doesn't take more than a day for all of us to run almost 270 miles of sidewalk. But then, you know, you see the couple we've had this year with 10, 12, 15, 18 inches of snow, and that becomes a long, long process. When we do get a, a two or three day snow event, you know, we ask a lot of our crew to come in early, work late, sleep on minimum hours of sleep, and then come back and repeat two, three days in a row. And that's not the end of it. Then we have to think about cleaning up and preparing for the next event. It's pretty fun, but it does get old when you do it days and days and days in a row. I like the satisfaction of having a clear road after I've gone through, make sure the drivers are safe. It's just kind of fun to like see that you're actually doing something. There's some self-satisfaction when you see a road you can't drive on and once you go by it, it's you know, like right down to the pavement almost, so. When I'm plowing, I like to make sure I have a good Spotify playlist to listen to. Tunes and podcasts. I usually start every snowfall event with the same playlist. Yes, you'd say a lot of caffeine. Coffee, coffee's a big thing for me. Drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> Just knowing it's going to be a long day. Energy drinks and some good snacks and candy. Lots of coffee and music and you kind of just roll with it all day long. So this winter has been extremely challenging, not because of just the snow that we deal with during the winter, but it's also been the amount of rain we've had this year. It's hard to get the snow up over the banks at this point, get it close enough to the mailboxes and our routes. I guess our biggest challenge as we get to residentials is parked cars and garbage cans. There's been times that we can't even make it down the street because the cars are parked on both sides of the road. It can be frustrating because sometimes you can't get through the roads or you just can't clear the road as well as you would like to. And if we can't get the snow all the way to the curb, 
it's very hard to open those catch basins up. It can get pretty mentally draining as well as physically draining because there's no suspension. It's a pretty rough ride. Usually we try to get out every couple of hours, stretch, walk around a little bit because it is tight in the machines. Kind of helps with fatigue, a little backache, uh, legs kind of tense up a little bit. So We know it's going to take a long time. We got a lot of miles to cover. Just slow and steady and then once you get done, no, you're gonna have, uh, probably going to have to help somebody else. Breakdowns always happen, people get stuck. Some of the city members, they go home for the weekend. These folks, they're working around the clock. So that's been another challenge for them is working weekends, holidays, and they've been wonderful this year. So I appreciate all their hard work and makes my job easier. And obviously it helps out the traveling public in the city, keeping everybody safe. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in welcoming your Public Works Winter All-Stars? and they just keep on coming. It's a beautiful thing. You know, I'm told when we in invited them over that we wanted to do this, we thought we'd get 15 or 20 of them, right? Because who wants to go to a state of the city address? Uh, and it turns out almost all of them wanted to come here. You know what? This group gets so little recognition because people usually don't see them. So let's just tell them again. They're still coming in. They are. All right, uh, thank you each and every one of you for being here. This is once again a fantastic day to celebrate all that's great in Bloomington. Uh, like I said when I started here, uh, working for this city council is an absolute privilege. Uh, they, define, um, they define leadership and vision, and it really is, um, it really is a good thing for Bloomington uh, that they are guiding us into the future. And like I said before, the staff that work for the city of Bloomington uh, are top-notch. You know, city manager can be kind of a tough job, and I, yeah, I'll tell you, I think I have the easiest job in the state of Minnesota because I have so many fantastic people working with me who are really good at what they do. So on behalf of all of them, on behalf of the city council, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a supporter and advocate for Bloomington, and thank you for doing what you do to make this a remarkable and enduring community where people want to be. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.